my name is Charity Hill. I'm a medical doctor and I specialize in the treatment of uh, treatment of pelvic pain conditions for men and women. And I'm here with Dr. Tylee and Gail O'Neill, who's a physical therapist. Um, we work as a team to treat these patients uh, since that's the way that we treat them best. And today we're just gathering to talk about uh, the journey that a pelvic pain patient may take on, on the road and how they end up in our offices and some of the things we do to treat them. Um, so I will let Dr. Kylie introduce herself and then Dr. O'Neill and then uh, we'll go from there. All right, thanks. I'm Dr. Linda Kylie at the Palm Beach Center for Pelvic Health and I'm a urogynecologist um, the name of our subspecialty is actually female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery. Um, so I have a subspecialty certification beyond obstetrician gynecology. So a large part of my practice involves seeing women who have pain um, and specifically pelvic pain, although it's often not limited to the pelvis. So when I see a patient in my office who comes in with, you know, whatever complaint it happens to be, uh, it may be incontinence, it may be urinary tract infections, it may be they feel that they have prolapse or a dropping of their organs. It doesn't really matter what their initial statement is about I'm coming here because um, for me, the most important thing is that I get their entire story. I get the whole story of what their symptom is, not what somebody told them they have, because often they'll come in with somebody else's diagnosis and indeed, that's not exactly what is going on. So I asked them, tell me what's bothering you. And then we really go through an entire history of when, you know, when did it start? Can you associate anything with it? And I try to validate their experience and their feelings because many of these women have been in, uh, in to see multiple other doctors or practitioners or what have you. And feel like they've been either told they have a psychiatric problem and they need to be on medications for that, or that they're imagining it, or that you know this, it's impossible that you can be having this. And so they don't feel validated and um, they feel like they've been told they're crazy. So for me, the first step really is to validate their experience and explain to them that I believe that they're telling me the truth. You know. Um, then we go into records and history and life events, and then we go beyond that to diet, what kind of fluids they drink, what kind of activities they do, what traumas they've had, even if they're small ones, have they been traveling? Is there anyone around them who's had any experiences like this? What is their family history like? Um, so really do the best I can to get the story. And then do a very detailed physical examination head to toe. Um, I don't look in people's eyes or ears, but that's about the only thing I don't do. Um, so it's critical for me to get as much information, both verbally and um, visually as I can, and then get all the information I get from my hands when laying hands on the patient. So this is not something that can be done as a virtual telemedicine visit. This is a hands-on, one-on-one thing, whether we've got masks on or whether we don't have masks on, it doesn't matter. I have to touch my patients and find out where they are having distress, what might be um, not quite normal. Um, I check their heart, I check their necks, as well as abdomen, pelvis, you know, the usual kinds of things. Um, and then once I've got a pretty good feeling for what's going on, either confirming some of the things that they've been told by other practitioners or telling them, you know, I really don't think it's that. I really think what you're experiencing based on what you're telling me is a different sort of a problem that requires a different approach. And so um, once that's all done, I create a treatment plan for them and um, it, Typically, I would say at least 80% of my patients need pelvic physical therapy. That's a very important part of it. Um, uh, for patients who have other musculoskeletal issues, um, I may send them to a chi trusted chiropractor. Um, I talk to them about their diet, what they're eating, what they're drinking, when, how much. Um, other medications, I review all of their meds because very often side effects can create problems that they're not aware of, even antibiotics. I mean, um, you know, we all know that there can be tendon issues with some of the fluoroquinolones, Cipro, Leviquin, that kind of thing. 
So um, I might add vaginal pain creams or oral medications, depending upon what's appropriate. But then, you know, we once we narrow it down, we, we really try to create a, a treatment program that is going to be a team-based approach because I don't do pelvic therapy. I don't do pudendal nerve blocks. I don't, you know, there are some things that I do. I certainly do, you know, a lot of different kinds of surgery and um, uh, I may do trigger point injections and things like that. But the majority of the things that I do, if it's not something I do all the time, I send it to someone who I'm part of a team with so that I feel like my patients are getting the best care that they can get. So um, that's pretty much where I go with all of this. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Kylie. I think the main point, which is so important, is validation because so many people have had their symptoms and concerns dismissed for so long. And it can be, you know, that alone can be very traumatizing uh, for patients. Um, and in my role as the physiatrist or physical medicine rehabilitation, I try to help quarterback the team and, and make sure, you know, all aspects are being controlled as do you. And so, Dr. O'Neill, do you want to tell us a little bit more about pelvic floor physical therapy and the role you can play and how you can support these patients? So, um, I have a, a, a long history background in orthopedics as well as pelvic floor physical therapy, which I think is a pretty nice combination because so many of our patients are coming in with so many different things aside from just specifically pelvic pain. Um, we have a private practice actually in the same building as Dr. Kylie, which is wonderful. Um, and um, we, our patients will come in and I think the most important thing that we're all sort of um, sp speaking about is really being able to listen and hear our patients' stories. Um, for just what Dr. Kylie said, so many of our patients have, have been to so many disciplines and, and, and they sometimes feel like no one is listening to them or or really understanding that they have a real problem. So we take a, a detailed history, um, all of the, the different things that, that, that Dr. Kylie already highlighted. We wanna know, try to find if there's a cause and effect of their pain, what, what makes, what exacerbates the pain, what makes it better, um, what activities they're associated with, um, have they any, had any past trauma in their life or is there anything that they can think of that, that sort of started when this pain began, although it could have been an early event in, in their life and it, it'll come out you know, 30 or 40 years later. I think the thing that we do um, also is we, we have a, our three-dimensional pelvic floor models for, with all the muscles and we really give our patients an education as to how those muscles work in particularly how they work with our organs. Um, so many patients come in, have absolutely no idea that muscles need to relax in order for you to be able to effectively urinate and defecate. They might be coming in with, with some of these symptoms that they think are maybe, maybe bladder oriented or rectal, rectum orient, oriented and find out that it's all because they have spasm in their muscles. Um, and then there's times when patients might come into me direct access, not coming from another um, physician where I'll feel that I really wanna make sure that nothing else is going on. So I will refer them over to, to Dr. Kylie. And we have, I can text with both of these doctors, which is so amazing. So we really have an open line of communication, which is so important. And then recently we've, we've um, been able to send a lot of um, some more of my chronic pelvic patients um, down to charity and, and had some just amazing injections and her being the quarterback, which I also think is something lacking in some of our more chronic pelvic pain patients where they just don't, you know, they have a little bit of this, a little bit of that, but no one's really looking at the whole picture. So we really um, are very fortunate that we have such a team that we can collaborate with and get our patients better. And that's, that's really our goal. Awesome. Thanks. And yeah, a little bit more about the role we try to play. Dr. Kylie and Dr. Neil have kind of alluded to the really thorough history and workup and you know, some people may be irritated that when uh, when we do start treating these pain conditions eventually, and I am sending them to out to these other team members, they are doing this thorough history over again, um, and they may have to do that a few times. That might be frustrating for people who've already seen a lot of providers, but it is important um, when you're seeing a trusted provider in the team that everyone has all the information um, so that we can take the best care of the patient. Um, 
I look at a patient from a more orthopedic approach where Dr. Kylie is looking more from a surgical and gynecological approach um, since that's more my background. So making sure there's no hernias, labral tears um, in the hip joints or anything else going on like that. Um, I can order imaging um, and we really, all of us have the same philosophy in treating these patients where um, we wanna start off with the most conservative approach that's gonna be appropriate um, and limiting risks of side effects. And so a lot of times we're starting with muscle relaxant suppositories or topical creams um, in combination with pelvic floor physical therapy. Um, because when these muscles um, are tight for so long, they get really short and spastic and weak. Um, and physical therapy is the most effective treatment at stretching that muscle, opening up at that fascia, um, and restoring the proper function to that muscle and allowing room for the nerves um, to heal and restore. Um, if that's not happening in a reasonable timeline, um, then there's obviously things that we can do to speed that up, whether it's adding on nerve pain medications by mouth, um, or doing injections, uh, either trigger point injections or nerve blocks um, into the pelvic area to speed that process up um, to give the patient relief more quickly. Uh, I think the really important thing is to make sure you can access providers and some people watching this video may not be in South Florida um, I'm, and might not know where to reach out to in your area um, and we will be adding on some resources to the end of this video, both links to all of our websites and links to other websites that can help you to access care in your area um, or closer to home. Because one thing I tell patients is like, don't give up. I won't give up on you and don't give up on yourself. Don't give up on advocating for yourself. Um, and don't be afraid to question providers and caretakers that you may have had who have dismissed your concerns. Just keep searching, keep looking, um, and you're going to find someone who's going to be able to help help you. Um, anything else that you guys would like to say before we close up the video? Yeah, actually, I wanted to agree with you. And then, you know, one of the things that I think is really important, because a lot of patients come in thinking that I'm going to recommend surgery, um, and that they're sort of afraid of that, um, or they've already had surgery and they're not better or they're worse. And um, although I'm a surgeon, I'm, I've been doing that for 30 years. It's you know something that I am trained to do. Um, I always tell them that surgery should be a last resort and not a first resort. And if you are not really given any alternatives besides surgery, and particularly you're given you know one option for one procedure and that's it, please don't do that before you've had a second opinion. And even when I talk to patients and tell them, you know, okay, well, it's looking like this is probably going to be, you, you do have a surgical issue. You have these other issues as well, but you have a surgical issue. But I tell them if I find, for example, the musculoskeletal problems, and let's say they have a really severe prolapse and I can't fit them with a the pessary, I still require them to go for pelvic therapy before I operate. And I tell them they're going to need to have pelvic therapy after I operate because this is not gonna fix the muscle problem. This is going to fix the anatomic disorder. Um, but if all you do is look at it from an anatomic standpoint without taking into account the other parts of the anatomy and physiology that are being affected, you're going to not achieve your goals and you're not going to be happy with your results even if it looks picture perfect you know and i've seen that many times i've had patients come in who had surgery and they have no prolapse they have nothing dropping but they're miserable so um i just want to emphasize i guess that seeing a urogynecologist doesn't mean you're going to get surgery what you need is you need a proper diagnosis and you need Sometimes you need a second opinion and if you go to a pelvic therapist, you need to be sure they really do have pelvic therapy training and they're not just going to put, you know, electrodes in and things in and have you squeezing all the time. You know, a, a properly trained, knowledgeable pelvic therapist is going to know how to deal with muscle spasm and the neur neuropathy that results from muscle spasm. So you really have to vet your therapist and make sure that they are trained in the things that you're going to need. So that's, I guess that's all I wanted to add is 
And I, I also think that there's a huge misconception when our patients come and, and maybe they have a, a little bit of knowledge of what pelvic floor physical therapy is and thinking it's all going to be about doing kegels and strengthening. And that's really probably very few of our patients where, where we start with that because we really try to emphasize that a tight muscle is a weak muscle. And um, we can't, you can't, you know, you wouldn't strengthen a muscle that it is tight. You would, you would want to get that muscle down into its normal range of motion. So I think once they can actually visualize what those muscles are, where they are, and understand that the, I think the mysterious part about that is because they're not, they're behind our vaginal and our rectal wall, we can't visibly see them. And that also, you know, that we, they need to be palpated. They need to, they need to be assessed to see what the quality of the tissue is. And then I think once they have that education and then everything else that we might need to do with our myofascial release, both, both external and internal, if it's indicated, then they, they know that this is, they buy into it. And then they have tools in their tool belt and strategies that they can do at home in order to um, improve their symptoms and, and, and attain their goals. Agree. One other thing is that, you know, I see patients a lot who have been told it's their uterus or their ovaries or their bladder or whatever, and it's really musculoskeletal. And I try to explain to them things like referred pain, you know, like if you have a gallbladder attack, you're not necessarily going to feel it in your gallbladder because you don't know what that feels like. You might have shoulder pain. You might have side pain somewhere that's not exactly where your gallbladder is. Your brain is interpreting the signal. So your brain is telling you it's something that you already know. You know, if you've had menstrual cramps before and you're having pelvic cramps, you're thinking it's your uterus, but it's not. So um, I think getting concepts across to patients who are not really knowledgeable about things like that, about referred pain and how the brain interprets signals um, is a big part of what I do. And I'm sure it's the same with you, you know, um, just getting all of that across to kind of change their perspective um, which once they get it, it's great, you know, but um, sometimes trying to convince our, my patients that, you know, this isn't what you think it is <laughs> um, can be a little difficult and challenging, um, but, you know, they get better when they get, when they go for therapy. So <laughs> I, guess yeah, that's I think the that's a line. really good point that sometimes this pain can be a little bit elusive um, and some days it may be around the urethra and same days it may be on the rectum, some days it might be on the tailbone or the sit bone um, or the lower abdomen. And that's not a reason for other doctors to blow you off or for you to think that this pain is in your head or imagined. It's just kind of the way that this, this kind of pain works is it's not necessarily consistent. The triggers might not make sense to you or to other doctors you're seeing. Um, but like I said, if you can find someone who's qualified to help you care for this condition um, and then um, connect with a team that can kind of support that, um, then you're going to have success. And so we'll make sure to link up some information from the doctors on this page um, and other resources in case you're not in the Florida area um, that you'll be able to find someone to help you. All right, we're going to sign off and hopefully we can do this again soon. It was lovely to see you guys. Thank you. It was a lot of fun.